So this is the beginning of a two-day class that is normally taught based on the basics of the International Function Point Users Group, or IFPUG, Function Point Analysis. I'm your webinar leader. I'm the president of Quality Plus Technologies. I'm a PMP project management professional. I've been a certified Function Point specialist for more than 20 years, which grants me the ability to become a fellow. I'm a certified Scrum Master, and I'm a professional engineer. Why should you listen to me? I've been involved in Function Points for a very long time. And as a classically trained engineer, things need to make sense before I can teach them. I'm a past president of the International Function Point Board of Directors. I'm part of the Heart of Agile.com leadership, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I've been a ISO IEC Joint Technical Committee 1 US expert on behalf of the International Function Point Users Group since 1994. So I've written standards and books on function point analysis or functional size measurement as it's more frequently called today. Before we get into that, I'd like to introduce you a little bit to the heart of Agile, which is a radical simplification of Agile principles. It was created by Dr. Alistair Coburn. There's a website called heartofagile.com, and it's a radical simplification of the approach to Agile software development or Agile development of any type that says, let's focus on the four main concepts, collaborate, to deliver, and then reflect and improve. In my humble opinion, collaboration is centered on better communication between people. And one of the ways to collaborate better or to communicate better is to have a common knowledge, a common terminology. When we're talking about software requirements, whether we build them in user stories, whether we document them through SRSs or software requirement specifications or use cases, or however we do it, we need to be able to communicate amongst all team members, whether they're stakeholders, developers, programmers, you name it. So I believe that software requirements can be facilitated through function point analysis. And because it is user centric and customer centric, it makes it easier to collaborate. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what we do in terms of software sizing. So the concepts are really to introduce functional size, to understand benefits and limitations of FPA or function point analysis, to learn where and how it fits into software development and cost estimation and testing. And anyone who does any webinar or any training that uses the function point counting practices manual or if bug documentation must include this disclaimer or this crediting. So this document contains materials which has been extracted from the IFPUG Counting Practices Manual. You don't need to know any more than that because if you take the two-day class, it will all be explained. It's a two-day workshop, as I mentioned, with an optional one-day client-customized workshop. So module one is the management overview, which we're, we're taking an extract of that today. It's usually about an hour and a half to introduce management to the concepts involved in function point analysis. We then go into really the accounting rules. We go through about a day or a day and a quarter of all of the rules that are required to count function points or size a piece of software. We go then through case studies and go through continued skills practice. So if you're interested in having a two-day class on site, I teach them all over the world please contact me at caroldeckers at gmail.com or at qualityplustech.com and more about this will be coming up. So an executive overview. Sometimes when we're involved in agile software development, when we're involved as a developer or a customer, we really are leading the charge. And so this is why I have the clip art here. It's kind of like measurement is sometimes leading the charge, leading the way. 
and whether you're a tester, a software developer, a customer, a stakeholder, we really need to have a common terminology and language in order to develop a piece of software or develop a product. When we look at software development, there's three software development challenges that occur and arise no matter what writings you look at. The first is requirements, the second is estimation, and the third is managing change. So in the area of development challenges under requirements, we have a challenge to as to whether or not our requirements, whether our use cases or our user stories or whatever we're going to develop a piece of software from, are they complete? Are they expressed in business terms? Are they understood by the entire team, whether it is the product owner, the scrum master, the developers? Who is it? Are we all understanding the same thing? And have we had documented the assumptions? No matter what type of requirements we're dealing with, size is a critical component. When we then have to estimate in terms of a budget, a schedule, duration, or time, typically estimation consists of multiple models, all based on complex weighted inputs. Our cost and our effort are going to be dependent on our language, our methodology, our skills, our experience, our hardware, our risk factors, what platforms, our subject matter. There's so many variables that come into play when we're trying to figure out how much it will cost to build a software product. And the size of that software product is of utmost importance. In order to do good estimation, we need to have, to have some historical base on which to base our current estimates. The third challenge comes in the area of change management. Change is absolutely inevitable. There will always be changes along a software development lifecycle. And that's part of the beauty of doing agile software development is that change can be managed. We can introduce change, we can respond to change, we can extrapolate to change. It's inevitable, but there's always trade-offs. If you are working on a firm fixed price contract, or if you're working at a time and materials contract, no matter what, there's trade-offs. If you're partially through developing a piece of software and the customer or product owner says, stop, we no longer need that particular report. There's time and energy that was built into that report already that was expended. And we need to figure out a way of being able to trade off against the budget, the scope, and the time. Customer defined quality. What does it actually mean to have a quality product? And then we've got contracts. Changes that happen are typically something that the supplier wants to resist in traditional language versus clarifications that the customer will say, those weren't actually changes, those were clarifications. There's the traditional rework. We have 20 to 30 to 40% on a project that is typically rework. That means if it's 40% rework, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we go in, MTW, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we do great work. And then Thursday and Friday, the 40%, we redo that. That's rework. And size of rework and the size of changes is absolutely critical. So let's take a look at the types of project requirements that we typically have. We have functional user requirements for a piece of software, so that's a product requirement. We have our non-functional user requirements, which again are a product requirement. Then we have our project or technical build requirements, which are our construction criteria, and all of those together formulate our project requirements. So let's look at them one by one. Our functional user requirements, that's the first type of requirement in that previous chart. They represent the functions or processes performed by or supported by our piece of software. So an example is record the ambient temperature. It describes what the software will do. This is the responsibility of users or customers to define. And think of functional requirements kind of like a floor plan for software. We can document functional user requirements 
the what the software will do with use cases or user stories, and the size of this functional floor plan, the size of my what requirements, my size of my business processes and procedures is my functional size in unadjusted function points. Function points represent the functional or floor plan size of a piece of software. Next, we have our non-functional requirements. Those don't mean that it's non-functional. It just means that these are not functional requirements. These are other requirements. This describes how the software must perform in terms of abilities, the suitability, interoperability, security, reliability, efficiency, maintainability, portability, quality, usability, all of those types of things. The supplementary specifications in a use case or object-oriented development or non-functional in agile development, typically they're poorly documented. There's almost like sprinkles on a cake. Those are the responsibility of users to define, and they're really like a building code for software. If my piece of software must be encrypted, if I must have 24 by 7 access, if it must be portable, if it must work on different types of hardware and software platforms, all of those types of things really represent my building code for software. They're partially covered by something called the value adjustment factor within function points. There's also another method called the software non-functional assessment process that sizes the non-functional aspects of software. And my non-functional requirements or NFRs can double the cost of a piece of software. So now we've got my floor plan for software, which we can size in function points. We then have my non-functional requirements, which are all of those things about how good, how, how well does it have to perform, how fast, how secure. Those are covered then through non-functional requirements assessment, through the value adjustment factor, which is part of function points, or through a separate method called SNAP. We need to know how good the software must be in order to estimate it or in order to estimate the schedule. The third type of requirement is when we take our floor plan and our building code, our functional and our non-functional requirements, and we turn that into blueprints. In other words, my technical or build requirements, which are really within the domain of developers. This is how my software will be built. It includes my tools, my method skills, my programming language, what tasks I'm going to do, the platforms, the software I'm going to use, the type of project. Those really have nothing to do with the customer or the user. Think of that kind of like taking the floor plan, my requirements, my functional requirements, and my non-functional requirements and figuring out how I'm going to build it. So it's things like, am I going to use a package? Do I have highly trained programmers? Am I using Agile or Waterfall? That's really part and parcel of how I choose to develop this piece of software. Those are not covered by function points at all. Those are architectural, environmental, and implementation specific. I need to know all three if I'm going to do a good estimate. When I'm looking at my project requirements and estimating, how much time it will take me to build this product, to build this piece of software in terms of my work effort, my number of hours, my labor hours, or my costs are going to be a function of my functional and my non-functional and my technical, plus of course my risks and other factors. So when I take a look at my work effort and my costs, it's going to be a function of my function point size. The larger the project or the larger the product that we're building, the bigger the floor plan, the more it's going to cost typically. I also need to take a look at my building code, my non-functional requirements, all of my quality requirements. The higher the quality, the more intensive, the more constraints and restrictions, the more things that I have to build in terms of performance and security and encryption the more it's typically going to cost. And then how I build it is also going to be built into the cost. In the same way, if you said to me, Carol, I want a thousand square foot log cabin and I bring in a kit 
and I build it from a kit, that will reduce the cost. If I hand build the entire thing, it's going to increase the cost. So when we look at a piece of software, we've got our functional sizing, say a thousand function points, my non-functional value adjustment factor or snap points. And then how am I going to build this? Am I bringing in a package? Am I cobbling together a package and customizing SAP solutions? Or am I going and hand building it? Do I need to train users? What's in my work breakdown structure? All of those things are part and parcel of my technical requirements. Function points fits purely in terms of the size of my functional floor plan or my what's. What will the software do? So what's a function point? It's a unit of measure which represents the functional size of application software. We take things in consideration from a user perspective or a customer perspective. And a user is any person or thing that communicates or interacts with my piece of software at any time. So a user, again, is the same context as in object-oriented programming. Anything that sits around the boundary of my application that either sends data in or receives data from my application software. And then we have the notion of a boundary. It's a conceptual interface between the software that we're looking at and the users. Users are always outside. So users could be a piece of software, another piece of hardware. It could be a person. It could be a department. Users are outside the boundary of my application. Function points measure software size from the user or customer viewpoint based on five standard components. We take a look at my data. Do I maintain data? So I've got my internal data. That's things like my employee master file. And then we take a look at an external view of data. That's data that is maintained somewhere else, such as within the post office. If I've got postal codes or zip codes or locations of cities, those types of things, a reference. Anything that I reference from my piece of software we're going to get points for simply by virtue of the fact we need to reference that data. So I've got my internal data and then I've got my external data that I simply reference to make my system work. Then I've got three types of transactional function types. That's the manipulation of the data that I maintain or that I reference. We've got external inputs, which are things like data entry screens and batch entries. We've got outputs, which are calculated in data that leaves my application. And then we've got inquiries, which are typically my browses. Show me, present to me, give me. The presentation of that data outside my application boundary. So we go through every piece of software that we would be building and we assign each of the function types within that piece of software. So we take a look at my internal files, my external files, my inputs, my outputs, my queries, and there's an entire methodology that is an ISO standard, a worldwide global standard for how many points and exactly what counts. So my internal files are going to be worth seven or 10 or 15 function points. External data is worth five or seven or 10. And we group these in terms of data components, which is all part of the methodology. External input processes are going to be worth three or four or six function points. Outputs and queries. Outputs contain calculations or derived data, and they're worth four or five or seven function points. External queries, which are my browsers typically, are going to be worth three or four or six function points. So each component gets a certain number of function points and we add all of those up to basically give me my floor plan size of what my software will do. So once we have this floor plan type size, if I can take a piece of software and say, okay, I'm building phase one contains a certain amount of functionality. It's a thousand function points. Now, when I take a look at the requirements, well, not only do I have my for my function points, I've actually got each of my elementary processes. My internal logical files or the internal data 
is grouped into entities, standalone business entities that a user would recognize as part and parcel of this piece of software. So in order to count function points, we need to have some idea of what are the requirements. And we size those. So we can start taking a look at this laundry list of requirements that belong to this piece of software. So I can start taking a look at the completeness. I can compare similar projects that I've completed in the past in terms of their function point profile, their breakdown. Do they have similar number or percentage of um, percentage number of data versus transactions? I can start taking a look at historical scope creep in terms of the percentage of growth. If we start building a piece of software and it's 18 months long for the schedule, that piece of software typically will grow 1.5% per month. According to Capers Jones, a very famous and prominent author in the area of software estimation and software measurement. Function point counting process can be effective as a peer review. When we're going through, when we look at all of the aspects of this piece of software. We've got inputs, my ads, my changes, my deletes, the C, the U, and the D, the create, update, and delete components of a CRUD matrix, and the reads would be a query. So when we walk through a, a function point counting process, it is what type of data is maintained by this piece of software? What types of data do we need to reference? What are my input processes? What are my output processes? And what are my queries? It's all presented in terms of business terms. So it's easier for customers to buy into and understand it. And again, we've got our functional requirements that are counted in function points. We've got our non-functional requirements that are sized in terms of value adjustment factor or SNAP. And then we've got our technical requirements. And because these are separated out when we do function point counting, it's easier for users and for customers to understand exactly what we're talking about when we scope out a project and figure out what the product might look like. We can document our assumptions. Early function point counts, which will be boxing off and saying, how big do we think this is going to be? Clarify our business needs. We can estimate function points from a backlog. We might have a set of user stories that we need to estimate. We can create an overall boxed approximation in the same way as you might say, oh, I want a house that's around 2,000 square feet. It's three bedrooms, one bath. I could look at a, at a system and say it's approximately 1,000 function points. And 500 function points are based on data or 200 function points are based on data and the rest are based on inputs, outputs, queries. I've got something very, very high level that can be the box about which I do an estimate. So we can estimate function points using incomplete or preliminary requirements. My function point count and my details are really my software specifications and size is absolutely critical in terms of what is to be built. From an estimation point of view, there's a lot of different models that are emerging. Function points is now 40 years old since they were first introduced. Measurement creates a repeatable gauge and function points allows a comparison of projects on the basis of size. So I can estimate based on how much did the last project cost? How much effort did it take? Well, how big was it? Instead of saying it was a very large project or large or colossal, I can now take a look and say it was around 5,000 function points. My complex weighted inputs, I can quantify the size independently of the attributes. We still need all of the attributes. We still need to know my functional requirements, my non-functional and my technical requirements, but my size, my functional size now becomes an objective input into my estimating model. And historical base. History predicts future performance better than theoretical models. And we can build up a historical base, a measurable historic base of projects based on building one project at a time. 
and recording the data on that project. My challenge number three, change management. We can start taking a look at tracking trends for process improvement in terms of function point scope creep. We can start taking a look at the trade-offs by making informed choices based on the quantified impact of function point size. So if I'm partway through a product development in a project and I want to throw away three reports that I'm three quarters through building, so those reports might each be worth seven function points, and if I'm 70% finished them, I've effectively already spent 4.9 function points worth of work. So if I want to bring in several new reports and trade that off, well, I've already spent 4.9, even though that report is scrapped, but I've done 70% of the work. So in the same way as a builder might issue a change order and say, I'm going to charge you a certain amount of point, a certain amount of dollars for building extra square feet, we in software development can then say, oh, you want to make that change? No problem. We're going to charge you a certain number of dollars per function point. So there's a lot of scope management techniques that are based on unit costs, based on function points that we can start taking a look at. And then we can take a look at the customer definition of quality, the areas of importance. We can start taking a look at portions of the scope in terms of functional size. We can look at saves versus changes. We can track the cost of saves, in other words, those defects that were detected before delivery versus the size of the delivered defects. We can start taking a look at better unpredictable changes. We can take a look at defect density in terms of defects per function point. We can also take a look at rework spirals, the size and function points, and the size, the user accountability through impact analysis and quantify our scope changes. Function points in summary are the functional size of software based on our functional user requirements, our floor plan. They're independent of the tools, technology, and other project attributes. 1,000 function points in Agile are 1,000 function points in Waterfall in terms of delivery. The product that's developed and delivered is the same size no matter how I built it. I end up with a product size. And to maximize my consistency and accuracy, we recommend that you use certified function point specialists or CFPSs. Function points are not directly related to work effort. In the same way as 1,000 square foot building might cost different amounts based on whether it's a hospital or an apartment or a mobile home. They're not indicative of my application complexity. That comes in with my non-functional requirements. Function points are not a silver bullet. They're not a Swiss army knife or magic. They give you one additional piece of information about the size of a piece of software. They're not an estimating model and they're not a quick fix or a solution to problems. Function points simply reflect what the software does from the user viewpoint, independently of how it's implemented. Once again, this is the first part it's a webinar for IFPUG 101, which is our hand function point analysis course. If you're interested in learning more and you'd like to take a two-day class, which can be offered online, can be offered at your site, or can be offered one-on-one, -on -one, please let me know and good luck in your measurement endeavors. Goodbye.